Excellencies, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to India Economic Summit on behalf of the World Economic Forum. Thanks to your engagement, thanks to your participation, we have an amazing turnout. Approximately 650 participants, business leaders, public figures from across the world, even Japan and Finland. We have certainly civil society represented, NGOs, academics, our social entrepreneurs, as well as our next generation, the youth, represented by our young global leaders and global shapers community. And yes, this is a very special meeting as we are living in a fractured world. And India, as the largest democracy, has a special voice and role to play. With its diversity and rich culture, India should contribute to all the economic and political discussions on a global level. And therefore, this summit is being held under the theme creating Indian narratives on global challenges. So again, it's all about collaboration. And on that note, I would like now to hand over because it's all about acting together. The India is now opened. CB, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip, and uh, very good morning to everyone. And it's been a pleasure over the last uh, many, many decades, actually three decades, we were just looking at our uh, notes yesterday. This is the 33rd edition, and since 1985, this has been indeed a very strong and a formidable partnership of the Confederation of Indian Industry with the World Economic Forum. And uh, we do uh, uh, really acknowledge the fact the way the World Economic Forum has been working on India, for India, uh, in the global stage, uh, giving us the full attention and the type of attention that the, that the country deserves today. And uh, we do see, uh, once again, a very strong team put up by the World Economic Forum globally to meet with a large number of Indian uh, counterparts uh, at this summit once again this year. This year, of course, is very special uh, with the summit with uh, two of our union cabinet ministers in, as co-chairs. One of them, as you can see, present over here, Mr. Piyush Goel, very recently taken over a huge challenge of the railways and uh, continuing on coal. Uh, so so him, him as one of the co-chairs is indeed, again, a very out of the box and a very important uh, thought process which goes into uh, fixing the, uh, creating the agenda, co-creating the agenda, if I can say, uh, between, uh, between the World Economic Forum and India. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, we have two days of very packed agenda which covers a diverse set of uh, which are related to some of the most critical and opportunity sectors for India, issues like climate change, issues like gender, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So a large number of topics, uh, and we have stakeholders from across each one of these uh, areas to participate over the next two days. So welcome, and uh, thank you for really responding in such, uh, such numbers in terms of quality, I must say. Once again, we have uh, a very strong qualitative turn turnout from both India and the globe to deliberate on some of the issues that we just talked about. So enjoy the next two days and look forward to your continued engagement and feedback to both the forum and the CII. Welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, CBs. Thank you, Philip, for, the, for formally opening uh, this summit. Um, my name is Lee Howell. I'm a member of the managing board and, and head of global programming. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to really have the opportunity to chair this opening session on creating Indian narratives. Uh, particularly, I see familiar faces. Uh, a decade ago, I had the responsibility of organizing this summit. And reflecting from that experience, um, this summit has been instrumental in really raising awareness around major global issues. It was really the first 
forum platform where we had in-depth discussions about inclusive growth, sustainability, particularly in the context of water. We talked about gender here. We've raised visibility, practice around public-private partnerships. Um, it's a very, very important forum, and it's a privilege, again, to be chairing this first session. India is the world's largest and most diverse democracy. It's something that Philip highlighted, and that's a fact that's gaining much more importance each and every day if you look at the rest of the world. You look at the rest of the world where there are many contentious discussions around the future of democracy itself and how to actually be more inclusive in terms of economic growth and prosperity. Um, I think in many ways, India remains a very important, very positive role model. Now, the to topic is around narratives, and I just want to introduce, if I may, just a quick bit about narratives itself, because it's actually an important area in economic thinking. Um, I'm going to quote uh, Robert Schiller, who's a Nobel laureate, uh, who you're probably familiar with. He, he, in a way, predicted two of the big financial bubbles in the past. And he's given a recent speech where he talks about narratives, and he says, stories going viral is a major driver of economic events. And that's his thesis put forth by him to introduce the concept of narrative economics. In conceptualizing narrative economics, Robert Schiller highlights you know, the research that says people judge current events by the similarities of memories of past events. And his notion that actually we, the economy itself thrives in response to the stories. And in a way, um, he, being a great quantitative economist, has finally acknowledged that we have to really understand this. We have to understand people more. Because that we, we really, as, as, as he says in his words around being, studying macroeconomics, we sort of fail to really understand how people respond and how the markets respond to these narratives. So it's a real pleasure and honor to have uh, the co-chairs here who actually will help us inform what those narratives are to help build and create what the future uh, signals to us and, and, and how we can be a part of that exciting future. Let me first introduce briefly the panel and then I'll welcome and have them make their introductory remarks. But to my immediate left is Mr. Ajay Banga, President and CEO of MasterCard. Uh, to his left is the honor, Honorable Piyush Gopal, who, as you know, is now the Union Minister of Railways and Coal of India. If I'm not mistaken, Minister, you are the largest employer in the country uh, and, and one of the oldest uh, ministries. Uh, next to his, uh, the minister's left is uh, Malvika Iyer, who is first a global shaper, part of the global shaper community, but is a member of the working group on youth, gender equality, uh, as part of the UN Interagency Network of Youth Development. And we can all agree that hearing from the next generation is a very important part when we talk about narratives and the future narratives that we want them to be a part of, or that they will shape. Uh, to her left is Sunil Bharti Mittal, chairman of uh, Bharti Enterprises, He's also, as you know, uh, uh, the head of the International Chamber of Commerce. His left is Karen Johar, who, in, the, in, in, in preparation, preparing for this, I was like, how can I introduce you? You're so, you're so multifaceted, so talented, and I'm just going to say filmmaker, uh, because I think we all recognize uh, the, his, his wonderful talents and his, his work. Uh, and to his uh, immediate left is uh, Dipali Goenka, CEO and Joint Managing Director of Wellspun India. Now, that, that's the panel, this is the panel, and if I may, um, I'd like to start with uh, a discussion around what is that, what narratives are being shaped, formed as we speak today and as we look to the future. And if I may um, turn first uh, to uh, the Honorable Minister in terms of sharing what he sees as that narrative that's emerging from India. Thank you, Mr. Havel, and congratulations to the World Economic Forum, one more very successful engagement that we are all looking forward to between Indian industry and uh, the WEF, which over the last few years has become probably the center of the world's economic leaders coming together, engaging with each other and coming up with probably the narrative for the future. So in some sense, what you just spoke about is uh, pretty much accurate. Narratives do tend to set uh, agendas, to, do tend to set the mood of the nation. And in some sense, that's exactly what uh, India is going through, a changing narrative. Over the years, India was well known for its, maybe for its yoga or Ayurveda, cricket or Bollywood for that matter. The narrative is changing. Brand India is being built up across the world now. India is being now recognized as a country which is honest in its dealings. 
India is now being recognized as a country where technology drives growth. So you have a Sunil Bharti Mittal, first generation entrepreneur started from the grassroots and created an international conglomerate. You have a nation which is probably going to give Visa and MasterCard a run for their money with uh, apps like Beam app, which will make digital transactions so simple and so cheap, so easy, that it may change the way the world does business. The narrative in India is changing. And that narrative is changing on the back of a very simple fundamental truth that mega structures can't be built on a weak foundation. And if India has to prepare itself for the global challenges of tomorrow, we'll need to have a strong foundation, a framework on which we plan for not a year or two of growth, not a year or two or five years of prosperity, but decades of prosperity for the people of India. And clearly, with the kind of uh, opportunity that exists in India, a billion people aspiring for a better quality of life, I think there's no better place in the world today to invest in. There's no larger market to service than the Indian market. And there's no pole which is going to be more important than India around which the world economy can flourish, can grow. That's, I think, the narrative I see going forward. Thank you, Minister. Building from that, can I turn to you, Sunil, to, to talk a bit about the private sector's view of that, that same narrative, or another part of that narrative? Uh, thank you, Dee. I'll just build on uh, what uh, Minister Goyal mentioned there. Uh, if you look at the globe today, and I see it uh, with my different hats as the chair of ICC, GSMA, in the UN and WTO, uh, what I'm reminded of is what Ian Bremer says, G0 a world without clear global leadership. I think we are today in an era where there is no <clears throat> global leader uh, which has emerged as a custodian of global order. I mean, there was a time when US could be the world's policeman, um, ensured to become the last uh, backstop for United Nations, for WTO, for IMF, uh, put out the Bretton Woods Accord. I think that is completely missing today. If you look at climate change, if you look at mass migration, if you look at global trade, uh, there is a complete confusion and vacuum. And if you keep that as a backdrop, global backdrop, and suddenly see what's happening here in India, there's a refreshing change here. As the world has lost uh, its narrative on global leadership, there's an Indian leader in the form of Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, who's emerged as a <clears throat> strong, very powerful, leader who's driving not only now Indian new agenda, but I would say the global agenda. Entrepreneurs like me grew up in the early days of uh, uh, reforms, but India was still struggling with its uh, integration of the country, irrigation, agriculture was the mainstay, and looking at industrializing its own country. Today, just in the last three years, those three eyes have shifted into uh, internationalization of India, into innovation, India becoming the innovation hub, or Indians globally uh, being powerfully involved in innovation, and inclusiveness. I think that's the new narrative of this country. And we are all inspired as um, entrepreneurs, the next generation, the startup India, the stand-up India, is getting deeply confident about India's ability and uh, its impression around the globe. India is uh, taking a lead in the climate uh, issues now. Uh, Minister Goyal will probably be able to talk a little bit more about that, but the fact is India has gone out and made a significant commitment into the Paris Accord, where it's uh, gone ahead and given commitments which are far, far ahead of what the international world was expecting us to uh, do. And that's what, that is leadership. That's a change in narrative. Today, India is open to the world in terms of FDI. It's the most open global uh, investment climate anywhere, I can say with confidence. Um, FIPB has been abolished. Most of the investments are at 100% automatic level. Handful of places are left where some approvals are required. India is also now compliant absolutely with WTO. Our duty structures are in line with what the world has been wanting us to do. But what worries me is, because of lack of global leadership, we are seeing the same large, uh, you know, powerful countries now starting to talk about barriers, movement of people being restricted, um, some uh, anti-dumping duties are being used or safeguard duties are being used in certain countries to block products coming from other places. And I think this is a time when India needs to even more forcefully 
uh, uh, you know, talk about its narrative of openness, open societies. Ajay, would you want to pick up on that? We've just, you, you know, and Sunil just re mentioned how really the story has to fit or actually is contending with other story con narratives that are emerging with the rest of the world, G0. But I think the powerful part is the three eyes you just mentioned. Um, what are your thoughts about the narrative from your perspective? So uh, I guess the first thing is that uh, I think that the Western world has been going through a period where manufacturing employment has declined for the past three decades. The financial crisis created an unequal playing field for capital versus labor, where capital has benefited and made even more money. Therefore, the inequality has actually expanded. That's led to some of this inward looking that both Piyush and Sunil were referring to. I believe that there are two narratives that India can develop in this logic. The first one is India's own narrative for India's own sake, for its own people, and that's jobs. Uh, my belief is that with 80% of the labor in India in the non-agricultural sector being in an informal economy, you cannot get productivity from an informal economy. You just cannot. Neither is the worker incented to get the right kind of skill sets, nor are corporations incented to invest in productivity for a transient labor force that isn't connected rightly to the way in which a Sunil would think about the future of Airtel out 10 and 20 years. And therefore, uh, changing that narrative of an informal to a formal economy is what this government has been attempting to do, whether you look at it from the perspective of manufacturing, skills, digitization, improving bank balance sheets, uh, really getting micro entrepreneurs, particularly in the case of women, going. I, tourism, I think these are all ways to get you know, formality into an informal economy. And I'm a student of economics many years ago. I was reminded yesterday at St. Stephen's, and the thing is that, that, that GDP growth depends on the growth of labor, which we have in plenty in this country, but multiplied by the growth of productivity. If you don't fix our productivity, you're not going to make things happen. Uh, Dipali and I were talking a little while ago. Uh, women in this country are, in fact, in an even worse situation on capabilities of productivity. If half the population of the country cannot have that productivity, you cannot break out of this cycle and generate the jobs we need for this country to own its own narrative. That's the first thing. The second narrative I believe India is ideally positioned for is what Sunil spoke so eloquently about. My belief is that with the withdrawal of a number of countries promoting the international order, this international order was set up after the Second World War. It's led to many decades of peace, despite the fractious nature of national governments. We cannot afford for that international order to be left bereft of a leadership. We have a very strong leader with a very strong capability with a country that is full of exciting, entrepreneurial, energetic people. Why the heck should it not be India's turn to be the leader of that system, to set a tone, to set a set of rules, and to say we are capable of being the leaders of this world. India needs to do a few more things to say that well. I think corporate governance, intellectual property, openness for market access, competing on the strength of our entrepreneurship, not on the strength of part barriers, part openness. And by the way, this is true for America too. Don't, please don't get me wrong, Piyush and I have talked about this many times. I am a believer that all economies need to think about the globalization of capital and labor if we're going to improve where we are going. But this is the two narratives, jobs for India, for Indians, and a leadership in the world that India and its citizens deserve the right to demonstrate. Thank you, Ajay. Now, I would like to close out this part a bit about the economic narrative and also start to move in towards the societal and the social narrative. And I think maybe I could start because actually, uh, Ajay just mentioned um, the policy how you have, you're have part of that in terms of being part, very much part of the economy, but also looking at the issues, the productivity challenge, but also the gender challenge, but also having to deal with a very tricky trade situation globally. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of the narratives? Um, I think for me, importantly, I think everybody has taken on the issues. I'll talk about my industry, textiles, and India, where India is primarily an agricultural country. And second to agriculture, 
textiles employs the maximum workforce in India, say around 35 million people. So when we talk about that, 50% are not employed. 50% are those women who are socially uh, in a stigma. They are not educated, not skilled enough. So when we are talking about digitization, can we take that digitization back to the homes and, the, and their villages where they can be educated? We, we are talking about the modern world, but have you forgotten about the craft which is dying in this country? Can we take that up? Which, because that can employ the maximum people in this part of the country. That can give employment and also empowerment to that woman. Because if she gets empowered, the child will go to school. We are talking about water and the scarcity. But I think for us as businesses, can we become the agents of change? Yes, we can. And I think government is doing their bit, but I think we need to do our bit as well. There are those PPPs that are created in, in parts of the country, I, I might say Gujarat, where 30 million liters of water are being recycled. So the farmers get water to be using it for their lands and irrigation, portable water. I think that is the key. That is the key to uh, what we can talk about. I think for me, the key thing that is close to my heart, and I think for India as well, and a lot of people will agree, would be gender diversity, social inclusion. In fact, also for the specially abled. Um, it's not about just women. It's about the deaf and mute. Can we employ them? And it is happening. I think these are the threads in our country which actually a lot of developing countries would also be facing. And uh, of course, um, I was speaking to uh, Mr. Rakesh Mittal today about agriculture. I think when we talk about how can farmers be armed, we, we talk about digitization. When we say that smartphones, the growth of smartphones has gone up by 50%, can the farmers be armed with apps so that they can take that forward and see how the conditions of the weather is or the crop is going to be like? Create a better cotton initiative, which has just been one initiative of its own kind. So I'll, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but I think that these are the key initiatives, I think, for me, and hence for the country as well, I feel, which is a developing country. No, but thank you, Dipal, because I think I, I'd go back to that original quote from Robert Schiller about how stories going viral um, is a major driver of economic events. And that's really key. If we can, some of these positive, inspiring stories can go viral. Um, and then with that n notion in mind, I'd, I'd like to turn to really, I think, one of the m more masterful storytellers that's among us, and, and, and love to hear from Karen and, in terms of what your thinking is about that future narrative. Well, thank you. And I have to say that um, this is daunting and very exhilarating for me to be on this extremely lustrous panel and platform. Um, I can only answer that question really as a filmmaker because, you know, I see my perspective just the way I see my films. And I feel very strongly that we're at the interval point of our narrative, which is a great point to be at because that's where you truly take stock of the situation. And as we all know that the second half of most cinema is when things speed up and pace up. And that's my real feeling for the Indian economy, whether it's socially, politically, or economically. I believe that there is a certain glass half empty, half full syndrome that we sometimes suffer from. And we have to just look at things where the, the glass is half full and not look at it like it's half empty. Um, whenever I travel to Europe, you know, there they're talking about their economy, about being either flat or negative, and they're hoping for it to be flat and not negative. And here we're, we still sometimes, there are so many sometimes negative and pessimistic voices about our economy, but we're at 6.7 as opposed to the projected 7.3, and that's still not flat. That's still progress. That's still on our way up. And I feel very strongly that that just like our films, our narrative is dramatic, sometimes melodramatic. Uh, it always has a tinge of humor, but eventually there's a happy ending. That's the way our cinema is. <laughs> and, and that's pretty much my hope for the narrative of India and will always be. Fantastic. I, I, I really subscribe to that. And, and um, the narrative that we're talking about, that happy ending, of course, the, the person that's probably most closest or the, or, the, or, the, or the demographic is really the young people, the millennials. 
I mean, right. they are part, they will, as much as us, shape that future. Uh, they will live, live through that future. That's and the other thing that I have to add, that demographically, we're really one of the youngest nations. And, um, you know, at 45, it's unfortunate that I can't, can't talk about youth. Uh, but one can definitely say that being one of the youngest economies is definitely paving the way forward for so much ideology that is new, nascent, and yet very upgrowing. Well, fortunately, we have among a coach here someone who could genuinely speak about youth because she is still young, and I'd like to invite uh, uh, Malvika to sort of share her thoughts about that narrative. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been lucky to be born into this generation which has been gifted with the sort of opportunities that our predecessors never imagined. I'm even luckier to be living in a time so ripe with possibilities. I belong to the millennial generation, a generation, depending on whom you speak to, is either the most enlightened or the laziest generation of all. <laughs> However you skin the cat, it cannot be denied that Indian millennials pose a quadruple threat. They're highly educated, they're very well connected, they're diverse, and their population is higher than their peers in other nations. As a result, they have a greater participation in the social, economic, and political aspects of the Indian experiment than the other young guns who came before them. I got married during the stormy monsoons of 2015 in Chennai. During a time when the entire city was drowning, the youth of the city threw the first life jacket to the stranded, the hungry, and the dying. I witnessed firsthand how the entire city took up the call and the people mobilized to help each other in a way I had never thought we were capable of. Better education, complemented by better connectivity, have conspired to create a class of Indian citizenry who seem to be living by the Mahatma's mantra, be the change you want to see in the world. This change is only going to be for the better with more Indians being brought into the realm of affordable education, sustained affirmative action, and digital awareness every day. Indian millennials find themselves in a country that is more aspirational than ever. Their parents and teachers have imbued them with an ambition to conquer the world. They see themselves as solution makers rather than as employees. They deem growth and experience more important than stability. They are more entrepreneurial than their parents and demand more out of life. The end result is twofold, a healthier free market and the promise of better governance. In an increasingly transparent world, Indian millennials are demanding a better class of products and services, both from the industry and the polity. Business practices are being discussed on LinkedIn, and speeches made on the floor of Lok Sabha are shared on Facebook as much as the quirky cat videos that's supposed to be filled with. India being the greatest cauldron there is, it is only logical that a disproportionate population of millennials is going to churn out the most value to the country than any other nation. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I love that notion of um, millennials as solution makers. That's really great. Particularly as a parent, I hope my children grow up to become solution makers. And it, and it, it, it does draw out something that we, we need to reconceptualize narratives about changing mindsets. Right? We need to think of millennials in a different way. We need to think of productivity. We need to think of all these different issues that have surfaced in this panel. And I'd like to um, have a second round of, of a conversation about, well, how do you use, what are the mindset challenges that you face? And how can we actually use these narratives to change? Because I think that's at the root of it, is how do we get people to change their minds through these, these narratives? And maybe I can come back to you, uh, Minister, with regard to that, because that is, I think, part of your remit itself in your, in your new uh, portfolio. Well, we have a... Uh railway system that over a century ago was initiated for a different purpose, but today has become the lifeline of uh, connectivity or transport in the country. As I'm diving deeper into the system as it exists, I find that layers of bureaucracy have been built up over every single incident that must have happened in the last 100 years. So you have one problem. To address that, you add one more layer into the working, into the system. And over the years, you've created a system that uh, is very slow to move. It takes ages to get uh, anything happening. And look at the multifarious losses to the Indian economy. 
it causes delays it uh, loses focus on costs it loses focus on efficiency and then whatever investments we are making is not as effective as it should have been but i personally believe it's not a very difficult thing to change that mindset i had a similar challenge uh, 3 years ago when india had uh, almost reconciled that we will always be short of coal will always be short of power in this country renewable energy was being looked upon with the uh, fear of very high costs and very little was being done to really change all that when this government came in prime minister modi gave me a few very simple nuggets or i could call them commandments very similar to what sunil must be using or dipali uses in her business what uh, ajay must be grappling with on a day to day basis simple things like unless you monitor the work and hold people accountable you're not going to get different outcomes very simple things like uh, get as much transparent as you can and you can address the challenge of corruption very simple things like uh, go for economies of scale and implement fast and you're going to you're bound to bring down costs and when we brought in these concepts into the working of government we found transformational results i mean barely 15 months into my first job we were able to declare that the country is power surplus the country has sufficient coal and for 18 months in a row i had to regulate production of coal in a country like india which was for the last 50 years short of coal for 18 months i had to regulate production of coal because there was not enough uh, off take of that product i think the same thing can happen in the railways we have a million plus people working in the railways i think they are very sincere i think they want to do a lot for the country if we can provide that enabling environment we can empower them i have no doubt in my mind that once again that can become the vehicle which will change the dynamics or the economic uh, perspective in india i was assessing just about 3 uh, or 4 days ago in an engagement with the top leadership of the railways what the investment potential in the railways is and what that could mean for jobs and my own sense is that may not be directly in a job in the railways which then gets reflected in numbers but certainly through engaging people in work in a variety of different areas across the system not less than a million jobs can be created in less than 12 months okay. only in the railways alone and the ecosystem around the railways the track renewable renewal program the safety related uh, maintenance program has such a large backlog that if i can aggressively go for that that alone will create over 200000 jobs when i look at the amount of real estate that the railways has in terms of stations in terms of prime parcels of land and use that to leverage economic growth also to leverage monetization of those assets so that i don't have to stress my railway passenger with more costs if i look at the amount of investments already in the pipeline and activate that going forward faster cut down the bureaucratic layers i think that alone can add another 200 250000 jobs existing projects so i think the potential is huge it's the mindset change which will transform india we've seen that happen in sector after sector it's the turn of the railways now and and look at the scale at which we've moved things uh, yesterday the prime minister was talking about a uh, simple thing like led bulbs it may sound very small but our led program today is leading the revolution in the world when i go to europe every european power minister tells me that thanks to india's leadership in leds they have been able to bring down their costs of converting to led lighting the united states is far far behind any effort to try and really combat climate change through affirmative action and we've been able to see transformative results uh, just the led program alone in the last uh, 27 months we've seen about 700 million led bulbs being sold in the country 700 million with not a single cent of government subsidy or support now that itself 
It's going to bring down our power consumption by about 11%. It's going to bring down the carbon dioxide emission by about 80 million tons annually. It's going to bring down consumers' power bills by $6.5 billion annually. And it'll save us about $20 billion of fresh investments. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the uh, participants of this may not like that idea. But it'll save the country $20 billion of investments in more coal-powered thermal plants in the future. So I think transformative results are possible. It's the self-confidence of the leadership and the vision that we provide to the nation that's going to determine future success in this country. That's a very, Minister, you, I mean, you, in a way, summed up really the challenge and the opportunity here. If we can get that mindset change, it's, it's really not, these are not simplistic, these are simple steps, but, but if you can get the people around, you can accomplish great things. And I'd love to invite others on the panel to talk about really how that narrative plus that change in mindset can lead to these actions that really have ex amazing results. Can I, can I do, can please, I talk please about talk. it? Interesting. I'll just uh, narrate a story about a girl of 24 years old, Avni Bhatra. Uh, she was part of a program with the world's biggest retailer and a manufacturer who traveled from Anjar to Arkansas. She was a child out of six girls. And she went and spoke about her experience in front of the leadership of the retailer in Arkansas. Imagine that aspiration that created for those little girls or young girls in the backyards of our country. Because when we talk about India, I think it's not about, as, as we talked about, it has to be at the grassroots level. And that's where, you know, when we talk about growth, growth needs to be brought to the villages, not the villages to the cities. I think that's very, very important. And I, I think that's where the whole beginning happens and ends. And I think uh, for, for me, uh, smart villages is again a very interesting partnership that I see. And when we see, when we see that why the change is not happening, are we making and are we making that step forward to make that change? There are villages, there, there is Raligao Siddhi in Maharashtra, which has renewable energy. There's, uh, there's, there's Odan, Odan Thurao in, in Tamil Nadu with wind energy. And there are smart villages like Pasari in Gujarat, which are e-governed, Wi-Fi enabled. Which are, which, ha, which are completely self-sustainable, organized waste disposal. I mean, if we can create those in our country, I think that's where, that's where the, India, the real India lives and thrives. And that's actually where, if, if, the, if we talk about literacy, if you, if you educate girls, I, and I mean, you're educating, educating the communities, you're educating the women, the children go to school, and I think that's where we need to start and make a beginning. Yeah, I think uh, one more area where we should have some focus, especially forums like these, uh, are to talk about business as a force for good. Uh, last decade, eight or 10 years, has not been good for business community. There was a time when businesses were considered as force for good not too long ago, and uh, role models uh, celebrated business success stories. But in the last five, seven, eight years, as uh, mentioned by you in your opening uh, remarks, the disparities amongst the poor and rich have only widened. The distribution of wealth has not reached uh, all levels of society. Small to medium enterprises are struggling to get credit from the banks. And all that is causing a lot of stress in the political system. How can we as businessmen uh, start to ensure that uh, the fruits of growth in any economy go as fast as possible down into the grassroots. The eye of inclusiveness, I have come back to that. How can India, therefore, start to uh, work towards making a business uh, uh, as a force for inclusive societies? I read a report yesterday that 200 top companies actually saw a reduction in employment in the last few years, and a significant reduction. And the, if these 200 top companies are not going to generate jobs, it's going to get harder and harder for the whole business community to pull the society along with it. And then you will leave millions and millions behind. And I think there should be some debate uh, amongst ourselves as a business community as to how we need to have some social angle to the businesses that we do. Can I, can I just yes. add a little bit? I think uh, just to change 
the perspective from what Sunil just mentioned. We've had three major interactions under the auspicious of Niti Ayo. We had Michael Porter coming in to talk to us, Bill Gates and the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Singapore, Thurman Shanmuganathan. All three talked about the changing nature of jobs worldwide. And I think India is going through the same churn. What Sunil just spoke about uh, companies uh, bringing down their employment is a very good sign, in fact. The fact that today the youth of uh, tomorrow is not looking to be a job seeker alone. He wants to be a job creator. The country today in India also is seeing more and more young people wanting to become entrepreneurs. And in, with the advent of 3D technology, uh, manufacturing, with artificial intelligence, with innovation playing a central role, more and more people are getting engaged on their own and are looking to become franchisees, looking to become uh, people who come up with ideas, people who want to be independent. I'll give you a simple example. Yesterday, I was assessing that I have about 2,000 railway stations where I don't have a booking office. These are very small remote stations which are called halt stations. So, And uh, I often get requests from uh, members of parliament that they want a booking office there. So I, while talking to my people, we said, if you open a booking office, we'll probably give four people a job. You'll have three and then a replacement on holidays. So maybe the numbers on the balance sheet of the company or the corporation, the Indian Railways, will increase by four. But rather than that, I would allow a local entrepreneur from that village, or maybe a young girl from that village, to take a franchise, take a small smartphone, and generate a, a ticket and out of our smartphone over and there. And I can help you do that better than Visa and others can. <laughs> <laughs> at, at affordable prices, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we have this, this goes on between us for years now, so don't worry about it. So that'll, that'll create a, a person, an entrepreneur, who will be incentivized to make sure everybody who comes in there buys a ticket, because his commission is going to be what he earns. So I'm not stressing the balance sheet of the railways, which already is quite uh, stressed. But at the same time, I'm creating transparency in the system. Everybody who comes there gets an opportunity to pay for his ticket and, and, and not suffer any ignominy on the way. And I'm creating a job which will never get reflected in any number. Mm -hmm. But that's the spirit of tomorrow. Wonderful. And I know that you, you both have an opportunity to, to carry on this bit of a debate in the afternoon, but I do want to have uh, Ajay jump in because you've been working so much on this notion of financial inclusiveness, uh, this inclusive growth, but also actually enabling it. Um, so I'd love to just your thoughts on this piece. Look, I, I, uh, there's no doubt that for many decades, this industry has focused on those who are more affluent and more capable of using electronic payments. But I've been in this company eight years, and I can tell you that in these eight years, what started out as a conversation people would not listen to me on, which is the cost and evil of cash in an economy. Eight years ago, this was not a topic that was discussed at every government. Today, every government is discussing the cost of cash and how it needs to change. I believe we have played a role in creating a public debate on it. I believe we have played a role with the help of the World Economic Forum and people like Queen Maxima and Jim Kim of the World Bank to change the nature in which our technology can be an enabler for people to get to inclusive growth. A little secret about our company that people don't know. In the last eight years, 360 million people in the world have got access to financial services through our technology. We don't make any money on that, back to the point about pricing. In fact, my view is what that's doing is it is making electronic payments and digitization ubiquitous. And ubiquity is in my self-interest as a company. So doing well and doing good should not be empty words. You have to prove with your actions and your balance sheet and your creativity and your people and your innovation that you care about this topic. My good luck is that my investors believe because of the narrative we have built about how this is a key for the future of our company, they believe in my effort to make this happen not just with partnership with people like Piyush here, but also in other countries, which, by the way, inclusive growth and inclusion is not an Indian problem. 
In the United States, 40 million people are considered unbanked and unincluded. 23 million people in the US pay their car insurance in cash wow. every month. Developed Europe has 90 million people who do not have access to proper financial services. It's very easy to point fingers at the emerging markets. You gotta start, you know, the old Hindi saying, when you point a finger, three fingers point <laughs> back at you. Just remember that. And that, to me, is what inclusive growth is all about. We are committed to it, we care about it, it's what we live with. It is today, using data, we are doing things on smart cities with Singapore, with Cochin, with a number of cities here. I think the idea of smart villages with the enablement that this government has done with biometrics. Because, you know, yesterday in a forum, a lady said that women aren't allowed to watch their phone and some cup panchayat in some town had fined the woman. And I said, if Saudi Arabia can allow women to drive, get those damn cup panchayats out of the system. Because it's time for people to stop getting taken in by old-fashioned ways of thinking when you have millennials like her encountering her visions for a future. Right? We before can't you, live in this. Before you get back, you must watch Toilet Ek Prem Katha. I see, actually, <laughs> someone told you. <laughs> and, and that's such an important point. Yeah, so the, it's very the, important. And so that's the focus. Why am I saying all this? Transforming the way people perceive your company and what you do with it, your people, is part of changing the narrative. Uh, today, uh, to give you an example, in the last four years, three and a half years, we have invested more than half a billion dollars in India. That is more than the revenue I made in India in three years. Forget the profits, which are a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. And in the next four years, I have committed to the Prime Minister and Piyush's presence once, actually, that I will put in another $800 million into this country. That's a total of 8,000 crores in five years. By the way, India is 3% of my revenue and 14% of my employees, and I don't have back, back office call centers. I have high quality technologists producing cybersecurity and mobile payment systems for the world from India. That's right. And, and, and to be clear, when I joined the company, my workforce in India was one fraction of that 14%. And that's because India deserves that investment, not because I came from India. I'm responsible to my shareholders. This is where the quality of cybersecurity development and mobile technology is going to break through the barriers that others cannot do. That's what I'm interested in. That's where my money is going. And that's, what, that's why I believe if you want to change narratives, you've got to start from a vision and a passion and then find the purpose. And that's what this government is doing. They're running the government like a company. And I wish companies ran a bit more like this government and life would be fine. But Ajay, I think uh, you point out something, the power of the narrative to get all your stakeholders together you have to. and behind you, and you that's have to. really powerful. Now, I'm going to be a bit unfair to close the session because we have about seven minutes. Um, we've spoken about and we've learned and heard from uh, you about some really inspiring narratives. But uh, again, I said I, I said I would be a bit unfair. So I'd love to each of you to just pick one word as you think forward about what that, what, that would sum up your view of that narrative, and also the one issue that you'd like to see some progress being made, or a lot of progress being made, or a really transformation to happen, uh, to occur, as, as a result of, of this summit. So again, um, I know it's about narratives, but I'm gonna hold you to one word about your what you think of, when you think about the future, and one issue that you think this summit can actually move the needle on. Can I start with you, Bali? For me, uh, one word would be social inclusiveness. I think that's very, very important because if you do that, um, you know, you have a population of 1.2 billion people. You have the youngest population in the world. And if that happens, that's where you go. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking more than one word. But I think the key thing I would talk about would be agriculture for me. I think if, if you do that, because it's a maximum employer, maximum, it, it isn't, let's face the facts. We might talk about technology, but India is an agricultural country. But the, the maximum rates of uh, suicide you know, happening in the country, how can we you know, look at that? I think that would be a key thing that we should be taking forward in this. And I would see that as an important aspect from my perspective. Thank you, Dipali. Karen? Uh, resilience, I think. To fall and rise is what our, the history of our country has always taught us. So I think resilience is the one word that comes to my mind immediately. And to answer your second question about, I think, you know, what the economic, the, the India Summit for the World Economic Forum needs to kind of move the needle on. Uh, I think absorption, because that's what I've learned on this panel, is to absorb and then to emulate. Thank you. Sunil? Well, I'll choose hope. And I think our Prime Minister also very well articulated very well yesterday. 
we should never lose hope because hope has a very powerful uh, reaction in the society and we should never lose sight of that one word if you want, hope. Um, the Nothing one to... word would be attitude. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to put an end to discriminatory attitude towards all sets of marginalized people. So That's the youthful speaker. And the answer to your second question, I believe uh, there is no better barometer of a health democracy, of a healthy democracy than voter participation in elections. So I want to leave you with a statistic and a clever quip. The turnout of young voters in the 1998 Lok Sabha elections was 60%, 55% in 2004, and a whopping 68% in 2014. Now, many a pundit would have an explanation for this phenomenon. This is mine. India's youth are a lot less cynical of democracy. They pay into it, they wish to see it grow healthy, and they are unafraid of what comes of it. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think uh, trust, the fact that we can trust the people of India and the people of India can trust us is very important. It brings confidence, self-confidence in the system. And uh, that also brings the can-do and will-do spirit into the nation. The fact that we can trust our own ability, the ability of our people, the ability of our nation. And once we trust that, we can combat climate change, we can combat terrorism, we can combat any kind of pessimism in the system. So I have full faith and hope that this country is a country where trust plays a very important role around the future. Thank you, Minister. I say my word is jobs, and I think that's where the focus has to be. That's the word. Uh, you asked for a separate second part, and that is, I was just thinking about a quotation from George Bernard Shaw, which I kind of typifies what people are saying. Uh, the, he used to say that a lot of people look at what they see and, and they can look at it, and they say, why? But I look, as he said, I look at what could be, and I say, why not? So my point is, what is India's limits of its imagination on what India can be when it is capable of unleashing what the government and people and people like these five colleagues of mine speak about on the stage? That's what I'd like to think about. Thank you. Why not? Well, let, me, let me close with my, as prerogative of the chair, to um, share one word. My one word would be a great thanks not just to our co-chairs, but everyone here, because the commitment to be part of this, to actually, to, to vest yourselves and your organizations to a higher purpose, to a higher cause, to be able to build that narrative that brings all the stakeholders together. There's nothing more noble and more necessary and more needed in the world today, and that's to be able to be part of that here with you in India, to be with the World Economic Forum as a, as a platform to, to enable all the, the richness uh, of the diversity of stakeholders to come together to, to build and create that narrative. It's a real privilege and an honor. And again, I want to thank all of you, but particularly our co-chairs uh, for this really wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Yeah.